reminded by a leadership coach this week that we can sometimes get so caught up into our tasks and activities that we find out that there's really no result that we get from them. And so we want to focus in on things that um, result in results, in other words. And so I thought this is a great opportunity for us to do the same thing this week. We have a calling by God of what we're called to do. And we can sometimes get so caught up into tasks and activities that we don't recognize that they're not even leading to a result of the calling that we have. So let's take some time this week, look into God's word and say, what are the things that we can be doing that actually lead to a result? Welcome and thank you for joining with us uh, this week. We're going to take a little step back from the book of Genesis and we're going to jump into another section of the Bible. I really felt uh, actually of this morning God leading me in a different direction. Um, so we're going to be looking at a different aspect of what we look at in the Bible. As we look through Genesis we've been looking at the idea of magnifying God of just seeing him in like a new light and expanding him, seeing details about him that maybe we haven't thought before. And another thing we do when we read the Bible is we try to see ourselves in the Bible. And that's where we grow in our sanctification walk and see what it is that God is communicating to us. And so that's the gear that we're going to be going more into this week is seeing ourselves in the Bible. Uh, taking that step back and saying, God, what is it that you want to uh, speak uh, to me? It's going to be different this week. Uh, I'm going to do more reading of God's Word and letting His Word speak to us than I am going to be expounding on to it. Um, and I hope it's a blessing uh, to you. This isn't always the normal way we do things. I'll, as we get through a section, I'll kind of uh, rephrase it slightly to help it uh, sink into us. But really want to take some time this week and let God's Word uh, do most of the talking uh, into our lives. because. I think the passages in 1 Peter that we'll be reading are um, self-explanatory. More detail would help it uh, become more clear to us, and that's usually what we do. But I think this week, God is really asking just to hear the basics of what his word is, is calling out to. So a lot of text this week, um, but I think it's going to be good. So just follow along with me. We're going to find what it was that God was communicating through Peter uh, to his audience. Now, Peter, we're going to go into chapter 2 in the first verse. So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So there's some things that we have to remove, right? We're, we're purifying ourselves. And this isn't a complete list, but he says we want to remove all malice. That resentment uh, that we have towards other people that builds up into anger uh, that we'd have. Get rid of the deceit, right? The, the words that we use to manipulate uh, people through false information or not giving all the facts and so that they go in the wrong direction hypocrisy, to misrepresent ourselves, right? to say that we're something that we're not is to be in the form of hypocrisy, and envy, not wanting people to have something that you don't have, and being upset at them for that, and saying, if I can't have it, then they can't have it either, and all forms of slander, right? any way that you're using to def denounce the character of another human being, whether it's them personally or a position uh, that they hold or an occupation or whatever it might be, anything to defame or make other people think less of a, another human being is to slander them and we're to get rid of all that stuff out of our lives. And we're to desire God's revelation as a baby desires milk. Right? It needs that for its substance, for its life to grow, and it, it 
longs after it very hard, right? Any mother, father uh, understands that, the crying of the baby when it's hungry for, for milk, and that should be the Christian soul as well. When we haven't spent our time with the Lord, there should be an ache inside of us that is striving to get that nourishment from God Himself. Because we have tasted the Lord and seen that He is good. We've experienced God in our lives. And we've seen the goodness that has come from that. So we long earnestly for that connection with God, just as a baby longs for the milk. Verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices, acceptable God through Jesus Christ. For stands in scriptures, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. This last section reminds us here that they were destined, right? Just as God in his foreknowledge knew those who would choose him, he also knew those who would reject him. And they're destined to do that because God knows the choice that they're gonna make. He's not forcing them to reject him. He already knew that they would. And the stone that is being rejected is obviously speaking of Jesus Christ himself. He's rejected by the vast majority of humanity, but it says he's chosen by God because he's precious. Right? Everything that the, lo the world likes isn't always lined up with what God likes. And everything the world rejects isn't everything that God rejects. And Peter reminds us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we ourselves are like Christ in being these spiritual stones. And we're being built up in this spiritual house. We're a holy priesthood. Don't forget your role. A priest is somebody who connects people with God. That's who you are. You're holy, you're set apart, you're priesthood to connect other people with their creator, their Lord and their savior. That is your ultimate role in this life. And through that, a priest offers sacrifices to God. And we still do that today. Not literal sacrifices, but spiritual sacrifices, it says. And we see these listed throughout the scriptures. When we suffer for him, when we offer up the thanks or the praises on our lips, that's a sacrifice to God. That is our role and our function as Christians. And these things are only acceptable through Jesus Christ. That's why we have to accept his sacrifice for our sins because we can only be priests through the work that Christ has done. We can only offer sacrifices of a spiritual nature to God because of the work of, of Christ. It's Christ that made all these things possible. And so we have a mighty task that lies before us. Are we taking that role seriously? Are we taking our priestly role seriously and working for God? Are we helping connect people to God and their needs to God? Are we bringing their prayers up before the Lord for them, even for our other brothers and sisters? Verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for him, his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. 
once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Again, he reminds us that we are a royal priesthood. In the millennial kingdom, we're going to rule and reign with God. The actions we take today are setting the stage for what position we're going to have and, and how trustworthy we are in the ruling and reigning process. If we're not willing to confront sin uh, now, then we're probably not going to be willing to confront sin into the future. Are we willing to put Christ first now? Then we're willing to put Christ first in the future. And it's going to determine our positions in the millennial kingdom as we are a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. Right? We're part of God's kingdom. God took all the kingdoms and nations of this earth. And he says, I'm going to make another nation out of all of them. Those who have chosen to worship me. And we see this in the book of Revelation. Where we're a part of his kingdom. And there's these other nations that are out there as well. So we are a part of a holy nation. We're not just a part of the United States of America. But really our number one alliance is we are part of God's kingdom. That's the nation that we are connected with. A people that is God's. And what is our purpose? To proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into the marvelous light right? to proclaim his excellency that's to glorify God to proclaim the excellency of the one who has delivered us and he uses this imagery that we looked at at the beginning of Genesis right when God created light and we said how he uses that metaphorically for our relationship with him how darkness is useless you can't get anything done when you can't see anything but light makes work productive. And it's the same thing in our lives, right? Without Christ, life is kind of meaningless. We don't know why we're here, what we're supposed to do. But he's called us out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. Where life now has meaning. We, we know the purpose of life. We know why we are here. Our work has eternal value to it. We once weren't a people. Right? We were just part of whatever nation we're born into. But God pulled us from that and made us our own nation, just like he did with the children of Israel. Once we had no mercy, no protection from the punishment that we deserve, but now that we have accepted the work of Jesus Christ for our sins, now we have mercy. Now the judgment that was due to us is no longer held accountable to us because Christ paid it for us. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter reminds us that we are just sojourners here. This is not our home. We are just passing through this earth. So we need to abstain from everything that's of the passion of our fleshly nature. Because it's warring against our soul, right? Our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. And we have to be very careful of that. So we have to be mindful of our conduct of those that are the Gentiles, those who are not believers in the work of Jesus Christ. So we are honorable in front of them. So even when they speak against us, the glory of God will be shown at his visitation when he comes back to this earth in his millennial kingdom. The good work is being done by us. Verse 13, be subjective for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor 
everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. It's important to know at this time that Nero is the emperor of Rome. Now, Nero hasn't done the persecution of the church at this time, but according to Josephus, who is a Jewish historian that wrote about the, the history of, of what was going on during this time, he, we do know that Herod had killed his wife uh, by now. Uh, he was a man that was very nervous of, of different things. He uh, had sorcery going rampant throughout the empire. Uh, There's a lot of upheaval in his empire at this time. And Peter even brings up to follow the governors that are sent by him. Felix is the governor, and we read about him in the book of Acts that Paul stands before Felix. Felix didn't like the high priest uh, during the time that Peter is writing this, so Felix had him murdered out in public by somebody hiding a knife and stabbing him in the town square. And this became a thing that people recognized that, hey, you can get away with murder this way, so... There started to be a slaughter of a lot of individuals. They would uh, have their enemies murdered in the open square by having, hiring somebody to hide a knife and then just stabbing them. And so there was great up turmoil in, in uh, Rome and in the area of Jerusalem at this time because of the government authorities. But there's good, too, that the government was doing. It was bringing uh, peace and rule and order. And so even though there was bad that was being done, Peter lays out that... We're to be subject uh, to human institutions, right? We know in the Bible that at the point that they call us to do something that is against God, uh, we are to uh, not pursue those avenues. Uh, but when it doesn't fall in line with something that God has proclaimed, then we are to obey those authorities, uh, even to the point of uh, ones that aren't the best of um, example of morality or... Uh, who a good person should be that isn't the standard that God uh, lays out here and he reminds us in the 16th verse that yes we are free right um, Paul even mentions this all things are lawful for me but Paul adds not all things edify not all things are helpful and Peter says the same thing here let us or live as people who are free not using your freedom to cover up for evil. Don't use your freedom to do things that are of the flesh, that God doesn't um, give you the, the right to do or to say that you should do. Um, be careful of those things. Because we're supposed to be living as servants of God. We are serving God, right? We're, we are free, but don't forget we are also servants. Because we serve the King of Kings. We serve God, and we are called to do His will not our own will. So our freedom doesn't go to the extent of where we, we get to do whatever we want to do. Uh, we have to follow our Lord. And at the end of that section we read, in the latter part of, or in the middle of verse 17, we're reminded to love the brotherhood. Right? We're to love all people, even our enemies, but especially believers in Jesus Christ, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Make sure that you're giving them uh, the due respect that is needed to them. Because if you can't love your brothers and sisters in the Lord who, who worship and follow the same God that you do, then how are you going to love the world that rejects your God and so is going to reject a lot of the morality uh, that you agree with? So start there. Love your brothers and sisters first, even in areas that you disagree with them. Because if you can't get over that, then you're never going to be able to make it to the next step of loving the world. And going on beyond that and loving even your enemies who are ridiculing you and are persecuting you. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, 
because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Peter here reminds servants those who are working for their masters, and there was many forms of slavery during this time. You could be a slave because of war and you were taken from your home country and, and had to just work for free for another uh, individual. Uh, but there's also the slavery that came from you owed a debt. And so it was kind of like a welfare system. Uh, you don't have the money to pay somebody the debt you owed them, and so you work it off. Uh, so not quite the kind of slavery that we think of where you just have uh, no rights whatsoever, but there's something to be owed for that. And Peter's reminding people when you're in that position that you respect your masters whether they are good masters or whether they are even unjust. Because we're called as Christians to put others over ourselves. But he uses this to set up the example. If you are uh, aren't respectful to your master even if he's unjust and you mouth back off to him, you're going to get beaten for it. That's not persecution, Peter's saying. You're getting beat because you mouthed off to your master. If you tried to run away from your master, right, you got beat, not because you're being persecuted. You got beat because you broke the rule. You owed them money and you just tried to run away from them and not pay them back. You're getting beat because you did something unjust. If you get fined by the government because you broke a law, that's not persecution. That's your being held accountable for breaking the rule. So God's saying whether they're good or, or unjust, still treat them with respect. So if you are being persecuted or beaten, it's, it's because of their evil heart. It has nothing to do with what you're doing. That's persecution. Where I've done nothing wrong, and I am being treated as an enemy. Now you're being persecuted. So Peter is warning us, like, make sure whatever walk that you're in, that you can honestly say the punishment that is coming towards me is not deserved because I have done no wrong. We even see this with arguments in marital relationships, right, or, or dating relationships. You can be right but go about it all the wrong way. Don't let yourself go there. If your spouse or your uh, significant other is just attacking you and it's not a legitimate attack, take it with gentleness and respect. So that way it's you're being treated unjustly. Great, there's reward for you in heaven for that, for taking it because Christ set the example of us, right? To be able to suffer even though you're righteous. But at the moment that you lash back out at them, that you belittle them or you raise your voice at them, now their attacks to you are in relation to a wrong that you have done. You're not innocent now anymore either. I hope you, you understand that, that Christ tried to set that example for us as saying, even if you're innocent, make sure you go about it the right way. Right, when we look back at the illustration that he gave of the government, we are blessed in our country that we have ways that we can try to create change in our government in a legal manner, right? We can sign petitions, we can do uh, peaceful protests that don't violate somebody else's rights, uh, we can vote, um, we can um, write letters to our Congress uh, people, all those different avenues that we can fight injustice in a legal manner. Uh, when it doesn't apply to something that God is, or is going against God's word, but if we break laws and rules, 
in doing that, if we protest in ways that violate other people's rights and violate um, uh, rules and regulations and guidelines, then anything that happens in return to us is due punishment because we have violated a law, right? You can't proclaim that you have been wrongly persecuted. So that's what Peter is trying to get across uh, to the reader here. Of make sure your conduct is always right. Remember, the number one person you're serving is the Lord. And if you're following everything that the Lord has asked you to be, of always being gentle and respectful, obeying authorities, then any punishment that comes your way, you'll know that, oh, this is an unjust punishment. Because we don't want to be like what we were in our former times, or we're being led and directed by our flesh nature and what we desire. But we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. For we once were those strange sheep that were doing our own thing. But we've returned now to the shepherd, the overseer of our souls. And he is the shepherd that leads us and guides us, and we go in the direction that our shepherd shows us. And one of those directions that he showed us is how to suffer for righteousness' sake. And how to do that in the manner that he says is glorifying to him. So that's what God is, is asking uh, for us. And I just thought devotions this morning, it was important to take a step back and say, who are we called to be uh, during this time of turmoil in our country and just even in, in life in general, of just reminding ourselves of, of God's calling onto our, into our lives. We just looked at a, a piece of what we're called to be as Christians. So let's focus on the results. What are we called to do in those those aspects, instead of just tasks and activities that we have that are lying before us. Let's make sure the things that we're endeavoring to do uh, have a result that's attached to them, and it's a result that we can measure and see, um, is this working? Uh, thank you for spending this time uh, with me this week, and I uh, pray you have a blessed rest of the week, and I look forward to connecting with you again. Mm -hmm.